In this year of 2023, there is a broad debate in Latin America on the economy, social, and political theories of liberalism, marked by numerous opi options, opinions on what liberalism really means in Latin America countries. The recently elected president of Argentina, Javier Milei, has started stated that he represents the only form of liberalism that is benef beneficial for all Argentina, but I don't agree. I do, however, agree with Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador when he points out that neoliberalism has caused many social problems for Mexicans. Meanwhile, Venezuela President Nicolás Maduro has denounced today's liberalism as being the same as neoliberalism. I don't agree totally with that identification. I do consider that a historian interested in studying the development of liberalism from the 19th century to today can provide valuable knowledge, knowledge and opinions to current debates on liberalism, neoliberalism, central liberalism, right-wing liberalism, and of course, progressive liberalism. A first affirmation is that liberalists, or better, these distinct liberalists are and always has been very flexible political, social, and economic theories that have changed according to social circumstances, economic conditions, and the political systems of each nation in a certain period. In addition, we must separate the beneficial effects from the pernicious ones that have been generated in different moments and specific circumstances. In Mexico, economic neoliberalism has certainly caused many social problems since 1990s. But in the same period, political liberalism allowed Mexico society to freely elect its representative in national and state government, permitting an effective division of power which means that the president no longer decides everything, establish a Supreme Court that is neutral and able to affect powerful economic and political interests, and obliged candidates to promote measures that favor the majority of the population and they seek election by what is now a real popular vote. Here are the ideas which led me to construct today Today's talk. The territory of Mexico today formed part of the Spanish Empire. From 1521 to 1821, Mexico, Mexico was called the Viceroyalty of New Spain, a land dependent on decisions taken by the authorities in Madrid, the seat of the court of the kings of Spain. The different social groups of New Spain, like those of Spain and other European kingdoms and empires, Live in a corporativist a state system in which each one employs certain rights and a specific obligation in accordance with their economic activity, the territory, the territory where they live, and their ethnic status. Broadly speaking, we can identify and estimate that the Viceroyalty was populated by three, uh, three, 300,000 Spaniards, 600,000 descendants of Africans called Afromestizos and 4 million indigenous, indigenous. In that state system, these three sectors did not pay the same taxes, as Spaniards had to pay a levy on commercial activities and the tithe to the church, while the indigenous did not, instead being obliged to pay tribute. That system forced all males aged 18 to 60 to pay an average of two pesos annually. This gave them certain rights, or more correctly, privilege, as the king authorities in Spain granted communal land, allowed them to maintain the indigenous governments and administer justice through a special organ called the, Gener the, the General, El Gen El Tribunal General de Indios, the General Tribunal of Indians, whose especially after 79, when the Spanish Empire had to def defend itself from the French Revolution and the government of Napoleon Bonaparte, the King Royal Treasure, Hacienda Real, 
has had to increase the revenue collected from all subjects in the empire. Officials, officials in the New Spain explored diverse ways to increase income, such as raising the Indian tribute payment. Not surprisingly, the indigenous population vigorously opposed those fiscal reforms. In fact, the, the intense pressure accepted on that sector led to numerous rebellions and riots. The, port, the important element to emphasize at this point is that the year of 1810 brought, brought another historical change to New Spain. In 1810, saw the outbreak or break of a civil war that triggered abrupt changes in the existing fiscal system based on a specific privilege granted to individuals of distinct ethnic status and more generally to sector of the society of colonial. The war initiated a transformation of the whole society of colonial times. In September, in September 1810, the priest Miguel Hidalgo, an insurgent leader committed to achieving New Spain independence from the Spanish monarchy and establishing a new country, issued a call to all people to take up arms against the bad government, thus sparking the war that lasted until 1821. The royalist groups loyal to the Spanish monarchy that favored New Spain remaining in the empire mobilized their troops and fought in numerous military confrontations between 1810 and 1821. The war between royalists and insurgents raged for over 10 years, causing, among many other effects, the collapse of the revenue-collecting branches of the royal treasury, Real Hacienda. In late 1811, by Roy, by Roy Francisco Javier Veneda reported that the fight against the rebels has sunk New Spain's finances into a deep crisis, as normal sources of income, especially the tax of tobacco, had dried up completely. completely. It, had, it, it had also become increasingly difficult to collect on commercial activities, alcabalas, and tight diezmos. At the same time, insurgents and rebel leaders were implementing effective measures to reduce the fiscal burden on the popular classes in the late 18th century, especially the indigenous. Considering it highly, highly unjust that popular group, especially the indigenous, has to support such a heavy fiscal load, those leaders deemed, deemed it essential to eliminate the taxes, the taxes imposed by the treasury. Thus, emerging insurgents and government insisted that all people in New Spain, regardless of their ethnic status and previous privilege and exemption, fueros, should pay only the, tithe, the tithes and alcabalas, the later taxes on transaction with agricultural, livestock, commercial, and manufactured products. They also sought to ease the pressure on the indig indigenous celebrated the abolition of tribute, the per capita tax imposed on Indians. In fact, on November 17, 1810, Jose Maria Morelos, one of the main insurgent leaders, ordered that no one should have to pay tribute and that, uh, and that India should perceive their lands as their own. These measures were pillars of the social program of the insurgency that would later guide the construction of the fiscal model of insurrectionist government. It is important to stress that the indigenous people enthusiastically embraced the abolition of tribute by the insurgent governments in areas with large indigenous populations like Oaxaca, Guanajuato, and San Luis Potosí. Those groups stopped paying tribute to the treasury. A second significant effect of this social and fiscal measure pushed many, Indi push many Indians into the rank of the rebel armies thus broadening the social base of the insurgency. At the same time, efforts by royal treasury officials to collect tribute during the war sparked violent resistance among the indigenous, with many being killed or wounded. Aware that the abolition of the tribute had led many indigenous groups 
to support the insurgency, royal authority has no alternative but to eliminate tribute in all the lands of right by royalty of New Spain. On October 5, 1810, by Royal Venegas announced this measure in a desperate attempt to contain the growing social support for the Presidio and his troops. Thus, both rebel leaders and the king, kings of officials suspended tribute after 1810. However, King Fernando VII did not agree with the measure, so in March 1814, from his seat in Madrid, he ordered the restoration of the for or an enforcement of the fiscal structure of colonial time, stressing the importance of the Indians' obligation to pay tribute. The royal decree provoked distinct reaction of the per pertinence of imposing its terms in Spain. Treasury officials recommended starting effort to collect tribute, but warned in a round, roundabout way that obstacles existed and that the circumstances of war were frowned for idea. Regarding the intendentes and sus delegados in New Spain, we learned that they rejected the decree outright for it was fresh in the mind that the royalists had followed insurgents leaders in abolishing that heavy burden. They agreed that it would be best to wait for better times before imposing tribute. Two royal officials expressed arguments against this sovereign resolution in no uncertain terms. Fernando Perez Marañón argued it was no longer possible to, col to correct that mistake. See, since restituting tribute would only get, give rise to many problems as the indigenous would likely see it as a form of punishment and consider it a degradation. Its publication would only lead some to join the rebels. The new itself, the simple interpel interpolation of the obligation to pay tribute will ensure that all agreement with the indigenous will vanish and, they, and that they will seek impunity or freedom among the rebels. In conclusion, the Intendente of Guanajuato opined that it would be prudent to wait for the end of the rebellion, rebellion before attempting to reestablish tribute. Once the war was over, commerce will be reestablished and the taxes collected to maintain the king's troops will be suspended. The Royal Accordant coincided with those arguments, so orders were issued to disobey King Fernando's decree and not impose tribute again. Officials deemed it crucially important to avoid measures that could further inflame the social basis that supported the insurgency. So, a return to the structure of colonial, including tribute, was not feasible. feasible. Clearly, the bloody war between insurgents and royalists was a reality that had dissolved substantial elements of the colonial regime in Spain. A constituted and a formidable obstacle to turning the clock back to the way things has been, had been before 1810. The, mo the most important aspect to stress at this point is that the popular groups that supported the insurgents took advantage of the conflagration to reduce the fiscal pressure they had suffered since, since they had suffered <coughs> since the late 18th century. The indigenous, still the demographic majority in New Spain, fiercely opposed tribute and other taxes, including tithes. To the dismay, to the dismay of the authorities, their effort failed to overcome indigenous resistance. Extensive archival evidence bears witness to virulent opposition to tribute and other taxes that the Treasury had imposed before 1810. Wherever that pressure was felt, they, they rebelled against tax collection, and the officials involved were forced to des desist. Thus, the indigenous used the condition of war to eliminate, to eliminate important basis of the fiscal structure of colonial period and decrease the fiscal pressure that quite upon their lands and resources. 
The successful resistance by the indigenous was one of the main legacies of the war in the 19th century. In effect, as we shall see below, both the national and state governments largely lacked the administrative and political capacity to force indigenous peoples to pay amount, amounts similar to those they had once channeled into the treasury. Moreover, the popular classes, including the indigenous majority, succeeded in resisting the government, government efforts to extract significant tax revenue from the society and the economy during, during the broad span of the 19th century. But before we can continue analyzing the fiscal culture of the indigenous, we must understand that in 1821, the colony of Spain finally won his independence from the Spanish monarchy to emerge as a new country, Mexico. The leaders who actually culminated the independence movement, however, were not insurgents, but rather a coalition of Spaniards, American, mestizos, and to a lesser degree, indigenous leaders who finally put an end to domination by the Spanish monarchy. The leaders of the nascent nation sought to create a new fiscal structure that would leave colonial times behind. The efforts centered on organizing a system based on liberal principles, liberal principles, especially the funda funda fundamental tenet that all citizens, without exception, exception of privilege of any kind are obliged to contribute to the imposition of the state proportionally to their means. The key word of this ideology were all and proportional. The fiscal equality or liberalism entail that every inhabitant of the new, the new country without exception of privilege had to pay taxes and I stress above, as, as I stress above, colonial time system was based on exemption granted to potential taxpayers in different social groups. In contrast, the liberal leaders of the new nation, new, new nation insisted that all inhabitants had to contribute and adopting another liberal principle does so proportionally, according to each taxpayer wealth. Applying these principles imply that the state was to be sustained by the most fortunate, its wealthy citizens, that is, those individuals who benefited most greatly from government activities. In summary, the liberal principles of equality and proportionality guided the construction of the new fiscal structure of Mexico. Congressmen, deputados in the new, na in the new nation, broadly supported this liberal principle in 1821, convinced as they were that the public treasure should not be based on the privilege of colonial, of colonial times, and that it was essential to eliminate as soon as possible every element of the colonial, colonial tributary structure. I would not like to turn my attention I would, I would now like to turn my attention to the question of how these liberal principles and the consequence of war combined to bring the fiscal structure and privilege of colonial time to an end. Order issued in 1821 stipulated that all social sectors, all social sectors, including, of course, the indigenous, were to pay the same taxes. Obviously, this meant eliminating the ethnic categories that had been the very ba basis of the functioning of the colonial regime. As a result, after 1821, formally speaking, all Mexicans would enjoy the same rights and responsibilities. In fiscal terms, all sectors had the obligation to pay the same taxes in accordance with their properties and wealth. It was, it was under these guidelines that in 1822, the recently founded Treasury Department, Ministerio de Hacienda, presented a proposal to the Congress to tax people's assets, including, including capital, salaries, and other earnings. The, treasure, the Treasury Commission of the Congress supported the project because it complied with the liberal principle of equal taxation. As that initiative developed, 
legislation deputados on the commission insisted that the only way to ensure that people would pay taxes was to set contribution in proportion to their difference in wealth, thus upholding the above liberal tenets, including the obligation of the more fortunate and those with greater wealth that the forces of public order had to save to save work, to save work, to pay more than those who own only their person. As these short phrases emphasize, each person was to contribute in proportion to the means the Commission does found itself participating, participating in a long debate on liberalism, not only in Mexico, but also across Latin America, that centered on the premise that the state should be sustained by the wealthiest and those who benefited most, most for government programs, such as fomenting economic growth, constructing the infrastructure required to expand business and, and, and those industry and the essential labor of the repressive organs of government entrusted with maintaining public order. But not all congressmen, not all deputados agree with this reading of liberalism and the precept that all must pay with the more fortunate paying more, arguing that the government should implement only, only the first in Mexico's new fiscal structure structure while rejecting the ideas of proportionality and a state sustained by the wealthy sector of the population. As a result, in December 1822, the Treasury Commission presented a project to mediate this conflicted interpretation of liberal principles. There, their document proposed changing, charging a tax of income of four reales annually for every woman, every woman and man over the age of 14, all, inha all inhabitants of the nation, regardless of their wealth, will pay the fiscal authorities the same amount from their earnings. The Diputado, El Diputado Lorenzo de Zavala, specified three justifications of the levy. First, that it satisfied the principle of, of, universi of universality. Second, it will be easy to collect since a municipal commission will be entrusted with all the women and men of the stipulated age in the civil registry. And third, it will not be onerous for any citizens, not even the poor. The proposed tax on wages, however, generated hot debate inside and outside the Congress and revealed distinct posture on how to best interpret, interpret these liberal principles. The congressman, the deputado Francisco Arganda and Jose Maria Covarrubias, and the lawyer Wenceslao de, Balarque, de la Barquera held that income taxes was anti-liberal and should be excluded because it would leave the poor unable to feed themselves or save money to invest in their artisan, artisanal workshop stores or fields. Covarrubias, the representative of the state of Jalisco, stated that the means of all members of the state are unequal, so the Indians who suffer coal is roasted by the sun and must work behind his plow should not contribute like those who the heavens have privileged and so enjoy more social benefits. This tax failed because it never generated important revenue for the public treasury. The popular, the popular classes, especially the indigenous, were not forced to suffer under a heavy fiscal burden because, because official has neither the political, neither the administrative capacity to impose and collect taxes from those social sectors. The end result was that the crisis in fiscal revenue that began with the outbreak of the civil war in 1810 continued. The key point to focus on now is at this juncture is that the leadership, leadership groups in Mexico were unable to agree on a unified project for organizing the new fiscal system. Their distinct read, readings of the liberal principle that all most pay according to their means was one of the main problems of the absence of broad consensus of the doctrinal basis that will mark the nature of the treasure. Treasury. 
but their differences were not purely fiscal in nature. For those political groups did not concur on several central aspects of the structure of government in Mexico, for example, federal organization, the division of powers, the definition of citizens, electoral processes, and support for distinct economy sectors, among others, among others. Clearly, we cannot speak of unified political class at that time, but only of, of multiple power power groups, each of each one fiercely promoting and defending its project. One effect of this internal division among groups was that it allowed popular sectors to include, influence the formation of the political system, in general and spe specifically the fiscal structure of independent Mexico. Independent Mexico. Since the opposing elite group did not hesitate to mobilize those sectors in attempt to increase their political power. From, from 1825 to 1835, the bloc known as radical liberals, radical liberals organized and led popular groups in some re regions of Mexico to incline the balance of the political system in their favor and defeat their opponents, the so-called moderate liberals. Among other promises, the radical offer programs that will increase taxes on foreign, foreign health property to protect national partisan producers, eliminate the tithes paid to the church, lower commercial activities, attack the properties of people born in Spain who were vivid enemies of Mexican independence, and redistribute agricultural property, properties held by the church. After 18 24, diverse social groups mobilized across the land to call for the expulsion of the Spaniards. Their actions were so effective that both the state congress and the federal government enacted law to expel the children of Spain. In December 1828, Mexico City was the site of the Parian riot that forced General Gomez Pedraza to resign as president of the republic, while the year while the years from 1830 to 1822 witnessed the spread of the cruel Southern War in which the deposed President Vicente Guerrero mobilized broad popular sector in the state of Michoacán, Oaxaca, Mexico to fight the National Army. Those social conflicts reminded the country's political and economic elites that, the only, that only a few years before the Valle royalty had been caught in a civil war that stagnated, the development caused thousands of death, brought enormous economic losses, and left behind an intense social resentment that not even the culmination of independence could resolve. In a, clear, in a clear paradox, the violence that marked those popular mobilizations caused some radical liberals to renounce their difference with the moderate faction. So later, they, mot they motivate the vast majority of political groups to come together, to come together, set aside their diverse economic and political projects, and construct a strong, a strong unified consensus. In the end, a dominant political class formed, which agree on the urgent need to make the national army stronger, and in order to control popular movements and increase the power of the bureaucrats or the bureaucratic apparatus of the national state. Moreover, and this is the fundamental, and this is fundamental, the political class throw his support behind efforts by the national government to collect additional taxes and obtain resources that could be used to reinforce the country's armed forces and state bureaucracy. In this regard, in 1836, the political class, the political class, began, began, began to promote a far-reaching fiscal reform based on the two principles of liberalism analyzed above, and the taxes associated with them. On the one hand, levies were imposed on the property of the wealthiest taxpayers. On the other, a tax on income was applied to all men in the country. Obviously, this later measure intensify the fiscal burden on popular sectors, above all the indigenous. In my view, the most important measure imposed in 18, 
38 was the tax on wages or income. And include all wages, salaries, pension, gratification, benefit that workers or employees receive from any public or private institutions. The aim was to increase the treasures, treasuries tax base anomaly by incorporating popular sectors in rural and urban areas into the new fiscal regime, leaving no workers or employee exempt. The other series of taxes that the authorities proposed collecting from the popular classes consisted in a kind of head tax, pension personal. In this case, all main inhabitants of the Republic of age 18 years and over who had properties or are physically able to work will be subject to a tax that will vary from one man to the next, according to their earnings. This personal contribution was another step in the process of expanding the national tax base. Clearly, instead of attempting to oblige the property, property classes to substantially augment their contribution to public revenue, the idea was to increase enormously the number, the number of taxpayers. If we observe this tax from the perspective of the contrast, the, the contrast between rural and urban society in Mexico, it can be suggested that this levy was a key means that the Treasury Department adopted to extract resource, resources from the peasants in the countryside, especially agricultural day labor, servants, and chair croppers. What is important to emphasize here is that this project to intensify the fiscal burden by collecting more taxes from popular sectors, especially the indigenous, turned turn out to be effective and thus and those became reality. While, on the one hand, on the one hand, this reflected the fact that with support from the political class, with support for the political class, the national government had acquired the administrative capacity to collect taxes from those population sectors. On the other hand, the increase in taxation soon expanded social resistance and violent opposition among those very groups. Indeed, the year 1840 witnessed the first of several agrarian insurrections that followed upon, upon Mexican independence. While it is true that the period from 1821 to 1840 has been marked by numerous peasant rebellion and rising outbreak multiplied markedly, uh, outright multiplied markedly. Historians who have st studied those rural movements describe that period as years of crisis, years of crucial changes, crucial changes, and the time of absorption of popular revolt, of, sulk, of popular revolts. One of the main causes of those movements was the tax on wages. Between 1840 and 1845, residents of many towns in the Department of Zacatecas, Guanajuato, Tamaulipas, Michoacán protested against this tax. In the song called La Cañada de Michoacán, multiple indigenous towns took, took up arms to demand the elimination of the tax, while popular uprising were imminent in many places. The important, rebellion, the important rebellion in Mexico had immediate consequences, not only at the local level, but also nationally, as they led to the reduction of elimination of the tax on wages to control of rising. In fact, in July 1843, the spread of resistance forced President Santana's government to exempt from the, this tax those day laborers, laborers and domestic servants who earn less than 300 pesos annually. Although the rebellions in Mexico obtained positive results in the short term, for example, the exemption I just cited, I just cited this was not the case in long term. For the success of this, because the success of this popular movement is suspending tax collection was only momentary. In 1844, the National Congress ordered that the tax on wages once again be collected across the Republic, Republic, Republic in the terms established before 1843. 
economic elites and government officials in the parliament across Mexico intensified pressure to collect the tax. This return, this return to pre-1843 condition, however, allows us to evaluate the tax system that emerged from the original consensus forged by political groups in 1830. In the first conclusion is that the system, or at least its four principal components, had come to stay. Taxes on rural property, properties, urban laws, commercial and indu industrial establishment, and wages. In the rest of the 19th century and into the early years of the 20th century, those four taxes, especially the first three, were pillars of the public treasuries of most states in the Mexican Republic. Several factors from the events in 1842 to 1844 provide key to keys to explaining the permanence and importance that those four taxes acquired above all the low, the low impact on the property classes, both rural and urban, and the extension of the tax on wages to incorporate massive, sector, massive sectors of the population into government effort to sustain the national treasury. I have centered, I have centered my attention today on the fiscal culture of the popular classes, the vast majority made of, of indigenous peoples. But, but the constitution of the constitution of these social groups alone cannot fully explain the evolution of Mexico's fiscal system between 1820 and 1850, for it is only one part of the equation. equation. One key special is that the sectors that included the owners of agricultural and industrial enterprises were not willing, were not willing to pay taxes either. Those economic elites insisted that the new taxation system should ensure that the indigenous would shoulder most of the load. Of most of the load. While, while the elites paid lip service to the tenants that everyone must pay taxes, taxes, they rejected the concept of taxing people according to their wealth. In conclusion, as historian, we cannot simply jump through time to arrive at the present. We can analyze a certain period of history and immediately use that analysis to try to explain a current, current situation. But in this occasion, as Groucho Marx was famous for saying, I'm going to make an exception. Today, Mexico has the 15th largest, largest economy in the world and a population of almost 120 million, but, but a recent, recent population census on economy activity show, and on economy activity show, the country has a low fiscal burden compared, for example, to Chile or Argentina. Similar to that Asia countries, aside from China or Japan, and far below that more, that of more developed nations like the those of Europe. This situation of low revenue collection through taxation cannot be attributed to a specific government or a certain regime, for the truth is that the country's precarious fiscal situation has existed, existed for at least 200 years. This law stand is opposition only by national economy sector in Mexico, but also by all European and American commercial interests in Mexico was accentuated by the emerge of neoliberalism in the United As we know, neoliberalism insist that the fewer the taxes imposed on the economy, the greater that the amount of investment, which increased job creation. Cre creation. But as we also know today, this idea is false. The government of Brazil, to cite one virtuous example, imposed a tax rate of 25% of wealth that has allowed this country to promote social programs without reducing investment. So, I believe that the solution to this enormous problem that Mexican society faces today consisted 
in compliance with one of the principles of early liberalism in Mexico back around 1820, the one which holds that each person must pay in accordance with their wealth. Another country is possible, my dear. Thank <laughs> <laughs>